Topic Notes 14.2, Cetaceans in Cyrenians. This is a picture I took off the coast of Seattle during the summer with a resident pod of killer whales. These are primarily salmon eaters, and they're under quite a lot of threats right now as their populations are dropping. And their story is very similar to a lot of the stories of marine mammals around the world. So let's dive in and learn about it. Here's your main idea. Marine mammals are diverse and employ a wide variety of adaptations to live, feed, and reproduce in the marine environment. And of course, as always, make sure you're tracking your learning goals as you go along. Of course, one of the biggest misconceptions is when people call dolphins and whales fish. And of course, you guys know this. They're not fish. They're mammals, just like we are. And they have all the same characteristics of mammals in terms of being endothermic, having hair, having mammary glands, all of those sorts of things. But you can't help to notice that they have a very different shape and structure to deal with the marine environment. So how did they evolve? The truth is, scientists are still working on this. However, there are some clues in the fossil record that are pretty clear. The story starts back in the early Eocene, around 52 million years ago. Not really that long ago, considering geologic time. And I provided you a little bit of a geologic time scale on the left. And you can see kind of the Cambrian, 543 million years ago at the bottom. That's where a lot of the invertebrate phyla that we know of today began to show up. So all the way to the Eocene, which starts around 55 million years ago, is a pretty long time. So marine mammal evolution has really only occurred in the Cenozoic Epoch. There were a set of hoofed carnivorous mammals called pachystids, and they mark the possible beginning of marine mammal evolution. These creatures sort of look like this rat dog sort of thing, and they had structures, ear and tooth structures specifically, that are very similar to what would become modern cetaceans. Now there are other fossils, of course, fossil evidence across multiple species over millions of years that show adaptations. And these adaptations tend to fall under these categories. First of all, the development of large, powerful tails and something called nasal drift, where the nasal passages begin to move back, which would eventually become the blowhole. The eyes, of course, rotating to the sides of the head and the reduction and eventually loss of hind legs. Now, scientists are still uncovering fossils, and as they do so, the story becomes a little bit more clear, and we continue to evolve our, our thinking on this matter. But it's very clear to see that there was a reduction of hind limbs, and eventually the forelimbs would become flippers. And we know that even today, because if we take an x-ray of any marine mammals or any cetacean whale or dolphin's flipper, you can see the digits that would make up like your hand, for example. They're still there, you just don't see them because they're within one big flipper structure. So during the early and middle Miocene, around 15 million years ago, is when we first saw what we would consider the, mo the modern whale form. And here is an example of that. It uh, is Cytothrium, and it pretty much looks like what we get today. It was actually a bit smaller. They actually went through a growth spurt over time. Um, and again, this is still in the Cenozoic. So now let's look at the big characteristics for our modern cetaceans. So in general, they have a blowhole that's located at the top of the head. That's the entrance to the respiratory system. Uh, they have no external ears, but they do have small openings that are sort of plugged with wax. And on the right picture on the right, you can see a dolphin. If you look right behind the eye, you'll see a little indentation. There's a crease going through it, but there's a little indentation. That basically is the ear. They also don't have sweat glands. Remember, sweating is a way to keep cool for terrestrial animals. In the marine environment, they really aren't interested in staying cool. They're interested in staying warm. So it really doesn't make any sense. Their forelimbs are modified as flippers. They use them for stabilization generally. Their tail flukes act as their main propulsion. 
they do have dorsal fins, or some of them do. There are a few that don't. Um, and when they are present, they are used for control in terms of roll when they're in the water. And of course, they do have hair at some point in their lives. Generally, dolphin calves will have those little hair follicles on the rostrum, if you remember when we talked before. Now we'll start with suborder Mysticeti, or the baleen whales. These are the giants of the earth. They include the largest animal on the planet. In fact, the blue whale is not only the largest animal on the planet, it's the largest animal that's ever lived on the planet, period. These guys can get up to 98 feet long and up to over 173 tons. That's massive. Baleen whales in general have paired blowholes. So they actually have two on the top of their head compared to one for toothed whales and dolphins. And they have baleen plates on their upper jaw with no teeth. And they use this to sieve and filter out plankton. Yes, the largest animals on the earth eat the smallest in large quantities. Plankton is the name of the game, specifically more zooplankton than anything. Most baleen whales tend to migrate long distances to access for food. Now, if you remember back when we talked ecology, we talked about the productivity of the ocean. We talked about how some areas are more productive than others, usually due to the input of nutrients from upwellings or other sources. Whales are sensitive to this, and they're going to go to areas with high productivity that's going to have a lot of plankton, and that way they can feed. If you notice this map for humpback whales, the blue dots are areas that have high productivity, and that's the feeding grounds. They tend to be in colder waters. The pinkish spots are basically mating and calving grounds. This is where they go during the winter months. So it's clear, nutrient-poor water. They don't tend to feed a lot here, but it's a great place to raise their calves in a warmer environment. Calves are particularly susceptible to cold, especially when they're first born, until they start to gain weight. So it makes sense that they tend to start in warmer areas before they go off into the colder polar and arctic regions to feed for the first time. That also means that the mothers are generally going without food during those first uh, few months of life when their calves are nursing. Now big baleen whales like humpbacks, blue whales, and the uh, right whale over on the left picture there don't generally form a lot of social groups. Um, they do come together for mating and calving and even some cooperative feeding from time to time, but a lot of times you'll find them solo and alone. They do use sound for communications, specifically whale songs, and I'm sure you've heard about them before. This is generally produced by the males, and they produce these sounds to woo the females to come in. What's interesting is some of the whale songs, especially from humpback whales, will actually be replayed. And they can be sometimes over an hour long, which means these animals remember songs and they replay those songs over and over again. And more interesting, those songs can often get passed on from one geographical region to the next throughout the globe. It's almost like pop music on a radio station, and it starts to catch on and spread from one population of humpbacks to another across the globe. It's really kind of interesting. Baleen whales do not actually have echolocation. We're going to talk about that in a minute for toothed whales and dolphins, but they do not use echolocation. Now, toothed whales and dolphins are very familiar to everybody bottlenose dolphins being probably the most familiar, but then we also have things like killer whales, which are the largest of the dolphin family. And of course, Pacific white-sided dolphins show you a much smaller version of uh, toothed whales and dolphins. Sperm whales are the largest. And then in probably one of the more mysterious ones is the narwhal, which I have a picture of down there on the left on the bottom. And they have that unicorn tusk, if you will, which is actually a part of their teeth. Toothed whales and dolphins tend to be predatory, hence they have teeth. They have one single blowhole. 
Mating occurs throughout the year. Gestation generally occurs between 7 to 17 months, which is very wide because there's quite a lot of diversity here. They also live in very highly social structured groups called pods. This is unlike baleen whales. And these social groups and pods are very important to their lives. They also use sound and vocalizations to communicate with each other. We know for a while now that bottomless dolphins, for example, have what we call signature whistles or names for each other, so they can call each other by names. They also use sound for echolocation, which we'll get into in just a minute. Now, whether you're talking about baleen whales or toothed whales, they know how to adapt to cold water. And part of that adaptation, that thermoregulation that they have to maintain that high body temperature for a mammal is having a thick layer of blubber. Blubber is a uniform thick layer of fat under the skin. It provides insulation and energy reserves if it comes to that. On the picture to the top is an actual uh, cross section and cutout of a blubber layer from a baleen whale. You can see how thick it is compared to the hands of the researchers. Now on the bottom picture, you'll see the calipers held up showing the thickness of the blubber layer for a dolphin, a bottlenose dolphin, much thinner. Now, of course, this has a lot to do with basically size, energy ratios. Bottlenose dolphins are very high energy, high metabolism, and so they generally will tend to have a, a smaller blubber layer. Also, baleen whales tend to go in Arctic regions, so that's going to increase that blubber layer as well. We also have something called countercurrent flow. This is where warm blood from the arteries transfers heat to cold venous blood returning to the body core. This happens specifically in the pectoral fins. The pectoral fins, because they're out in the water and they're thin, they're going to lose a lot of heat. So if you take warm blood and stick it out in those pectoral fins, you know you're going to lose a lot of heat. So if you transfer the heat from that warm blood into the returning venous blood coming back from the limbs, then the heat is trapped in the body core and it doesn't continue to flow out to the extremity where it could lose that heat very easily. It's a great technique to stay warm in the water. Other adaptations include a collapsible and a flexible lung for exhaling and diving and really squeezing out all that air so they don't have compression issues. Remember, any airspace in the body is going to be affected by the pressure as you dive. They also have reduced heart rate. It slows from about 100 to about 10 beats per minute as you go down. The graph on the bottom actually shows an elephant seal's heart rate because we've been able to study them a bit more. And you can see uh, the heart rate is the pink line and the depth is the blue line. And you can see how the depth mimics the heart rate. As the heart rate goes down, the depth goes down and so on and so forth as it goes back up. So they're controlling their heart rate. They want to have a higher heart rate when they hit the surface so they can maximize the amount of oxygen they're gaining and CO2 they're dumping as they're respirating on the surface. Now we mentioned some of this with seals and sea lions last time around, but also cetaceans have the same thing. They have a high blood to body ratio with high concentration of red blood cells to carry more oxygen. They also have a high concentration of hemoglobin, about two times that of what we would normally have, and myoglobin, about 10 to 30 times what we have. This helps them to store a lot of oxygen in muscles during dives. And also, we ha they have the ability to preferentially shunt blood to vital organs throughout the dive, which also helps to keep them going. Our breathing response is actually tied to the amount of CO2 in the blood, not necessarily the amount of oxygen. For marine mammals, they actually, their brain is actually less sensitive to high CO2 levels, allowing them to actually hold their breath a little longer. Similarly, their muscles are less sensitive to lactic acid buildup, which often happens in lack of oxygen. They also are able to maximize their breath when they actually come to the surface. They can exchange somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the oxygen in their lungs with blood. Humans, we can only exchange about 15 to 25 percent per breath. So that's a huge difference. Now, just to give you an idea of who are the deep divers around here, um, there's a table there on the right that 
basically compares various different marine mammal groups, everything from a sea otter all the way to a sperm whale. And you can see just how deep some of these animals can go, especially sperm whales. Now remember, sperm whales will actually dive so deep to actually go after giant squid in these epic undersea battles in the dark. Which... Now whales and dolphins, in terms of reproduction, are all case strategists, meaning that they generally have one offspring at a time, rarely two, and they really take a lot of care for that offspring. Now calves are very vulnerable, so they need to get big fast, and that milk is designed for that. Their milk is between 40 and 50 percent fat, and that and about 10 to 12 percent protein. This is compared to cow milk, which is about 2 to 4 percent fat and 1 to 3 percent uh, protein, respectively. So they're getting a huge caloric value out of that milk so they can grow really quickly. To give you an idea, a blue whale calf can double its birth weight in its first week and then gain about 200 pounds a day from then on. Echolocation is huge for toothed whales and dolphins, and it is important to remember that baleen whales do not use it. It's only for odontoceti groups. This allows the odontocetes to use sound waves to distinguish and locate objects from a distance of several meters, and this is really useful, especially in the dark and deep waters, or in just murky coastal waters. The sound is created by circulating air under pressure through their navel, nasal passages. The sounds are then directed and focused by the melon, which is the, the in the diagram, it's the yellow kind of bulbish looking thing up towards the front right behind the rostrum and that melon again it's like a lens it helps focus the sound at that point the sound will travel out into the water it will hit something some object it will bounce back and return through the lower jaw of the dolphin that's sort of its tuning fork if you will for the sound returning and the sound will travel through that lower jaw into the inner ear and at that point, the brain will process that information and produce a mental image of the target object. Now you can imagine the Navy was definitely very interested in this very early on. And one of the, some of the first captive dolphins were actually kept simply to study this process and understand it. Our last group we're going to talk about is Order Sirenia, and that's our manatees. Manatees are an interesting creature in that uh, early sailors, when they were coming over to the New World, often mistook them for mermaids, according to lore, which I'm not really sure how that works, but hey, they did. Um, but they are really unique because their closest land relative is the elephant. They inhabit shallow tropical and subtropical waters, and they feed entirely on plants, seagrasses, algae, things like that. They use a prehensile upper lip to grab onto things and feed. And you can see that middle picture there has a manatee grabbing onto a rope. Um, they're very good at manipulating things with their, uh, with their prehensile uh, upper lip. Their nostrils can actually close with valves and their bones are very heavy compared to other marine mammals and that helps them stay on the bottom more when they're feeding. Now, in this group, we also have dugongs. Now, dugongs are similar to manatees, except they do have a bit of a forked tail like a dolphin. Uh, their rostral disc is oriented a little bit more down uh, for bottom feeding, and their range is generally in the Indo-West Pacific, so you do not see them in the Caribbean or in Florida. Uh, but they are in the Indo-West Pacific. They are the closest relatives to the stellar sea cow, which is now extinct, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, our Florida manatee is of an offset of the West Indian manatee that we normally have, and there are a couple of kind of subspecies, if you will, throughout from South America through the Caribbean and Florida. And there's still a lot of genetic work going on in terms of trying to sort that out. But generally speaking, if we just stay with our Florida manatees, they live along the Florida East and Gulf Coast, and they feed throughout the water column. On the bottom, anything floating on the top, primarily all vegetation. They are built for slow 
movements and also they can get into some confined spaces pretty well. The key thing though is they do need to migrate. They migrate with the weather. During the warmer summer months you will see them going way up the east coast into the Carolinas but during the winter they must come down to the South Florida area or in the springs in the center of the state where the water is warmer because manatees are not tolerant of cold water. They will go into cold shock and they can die very easily that way. Now I mentioned the stellar sea cow before. This was a species discovered in, in 1741 and by 1768 it was completely extinct. This was mainly due to hunting because they were, they were actually found along the Bering Strait between Russia and Alaska. So it was actually a cold watered animal, um, but it was still coastal and they were hunted for their meat and blubber. And we pretty much wiped them out. Their population was not apparently very big at the time. But what was interesting, however, is how big they really were. The largest of the Serenians, really, they got up to about 28 feet long and between 7 and 8 tons. So think about a manatee that was basically sort of the size of a killer whale. That's pretty impressive, but unfortunately we do not have any of them left on this planet. All right, it's time to throw it back to you. So why is being able to dive deep and stay underwater for long periods of time so important to most marine mammal species? All right, until next time, keep thinking.